Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Brad Muscle, and this is a reading of the Utility of Religion, Mill, Nietzsche, and James. This will be Section D of Part 2 of Chapter 1, John Stuart Mill and Utility of Religion. Again, this is Section D, Empirical Research. Since Mill's time, the relationship between religion and morality has been the subject of extensive empirical research. And I want to discuss some of the relevant findings before moving on to Mill's analysis of religion's individual utility. On the whole, the empirical research seems to corroborate much of what Mill says insofar as it fails to substantiate a positive correlation between religion and morality. In fact, the relevant research fails to yield any sort of a consensus regarding the true nature of the relationship between religion and morality. While some research hints at a positive correlation between the two, much of the research suggests that there is no positive correlation between them, or that there is even a negative correlation between them, i.e. as religiosity increases, moral behavior decreases. I now turn to a brief discussion of some of the research demonstrating the nebulous nature of the relationship between religion and morality. Evolutionary biologist Mark Hauser and philosopher Peter Singer suggest the following in a short article they co-authored together called Godless Morality. Quote, Atheists and agnostics do not behave less morally than religious believers, even if their virtuous acts are mediated by different principles. They often have as strong and, and sound a sense of right and wrong as anyone, including involvement in the and movements to abolish slavery and contribute to relief efforts associated with human suffering. End quote. Footnote 97 cites the source. Footnote 98. The authors go even further, suggesting, quote, the converse is also true. Religion has led people to commit a long litany of horrendous crimes, from God's command to Moses to slaughter the Midianites, men, women, boys, and non-virginal girls, through the Crusades, the Inquisition, the Thirty Years' War, innumerable conflicts between Sunni and Shiite Muslims and terrorists who blow themselves up in the, conf in the confident belief that they are going straight to paradise. Uh, and the, the, the source is cited there. End quote. Uh, so that's footnote 98. End of footnote 98. It is not hard, hard to imagine Mill saying something similar to this. In the same vein as Mill, the authors present difficulties associated with the thesis that religion is morally advantageous. Instead of rooting morality essentially and significantly in religion, Hauser and Singer make a case for grounding it in evolution. One reason they cite in support of their evolutionary foundation for moral behavior, which they also believe undermines the religious foundation, is the universal nature of certain basic moral principles. They write, quote, a difficulty for the view of that morality has its origins in morality, or sorry, in religion, is that despite the sharp doctrinal differences between the world's major religions, and for that matter, cultures like ancient China in which religion has been less significant than philosophical outlooks like Confucianism, some ele elements of morality seem to be universal, end quote. Footnote 99 cites the source. Hauser and Singer create what they call a, quote, web-based moral sense test in an effort, end quote, in an effort to demonstrate the universal nature of our moral sensibilities. This test presents the following three moral dilemmas and instructs the test taker to fill in the blanks with morally obligatory, permissible, or forbidden. One, a runaway trolley is about to run over five people walking on the tracks. A, railway, a railroad worker is standing next to a switch that can turn the trolley onto a side track, killing one person, but allowing the five to survive. Flipping the switch is blank. Two, you pass by a small child drowning in a shallow pond, and you are the one, the only one around. If you pick up the child, she will survive, and your pants will be ruined. Picking up the child is blank. Three, five people have just been rushed into a hospital in critical care, each requiring an organ to survive. There is not enough time to request organs from outside the hospital. There is, however, a healthy person in the hospital's waiting room. If the surgeon takes the, the person's organs, he will die, but the five in critical care will survive. Taking the healthy person's organs is blank. Footnote 100 cites the source. They reveal that a significant portion of the 1,500 subjects who responded from around the world responded with, 
permissible, obligatory, and forbidden in that order. They point out that, quote, there were no statistically significant differences between subjects with or without religious backgrounds, with approximately 90% of subjects saying that it is permissible to split the switch on the boxcar, 97% saying that it is obligatory to rescue the baby, and 97% saying that it is forbidden to remove the healthy man's organs, end quote. 101, footnote 101, cites the source. More, moreover, they add that, quote, when asked to justify why some cases are permissible and others forbidden, those with a religious background are as clueless or incoherent as atheists, end quote. Footnote 102 cites the source. They argue that, quote, on the view that morality is God's word, atheists should judge these cases differently from people with religious background and beliefs, and when asked to justify their responses, should bring forward different explanations. For example, since atheists lack a moral compass, they should go with pure self-interest and walk by the drowning baby, end quote. But note 103 cites the source. Since atheists do not, as it turns out, answer any differently and, and turn out to be just as selfless, the authors infer that morality is more universal in nature than, than those suggesting that religion is morally advantageous would lead us to believe. Hauser's and Singer's findings are far from conclusive especially given the limitations of their study. Most notably, its non-experimental nature. Consider, for example, its self-selected self -selected sample and the small number of moral dilemmas they incorporate. However, their findings are supported by other researchers. For example, Russell Middleton and Snell Putney found that when it comes to religious and skeptical individuals, quote, the two groups do not differ in the degree to which they believe in elements of common social morality, end quote. Footnote 104 cites the source. In their research, Middleton and Putney emphasize a distinction between two kinds of ethical standards, the ascetic and the social, which they argue underlies their findings, as well as most findings pertaining to the relationship under investigation. The impetus for their doing so lies in their observation of something I have already pointed out, Empirical investigations into the relationship between religion and morality have yielded conflicting results, and there is anything but a consensus amongst experts regarding the issue. On this point, they write, quote, Empirical studies such as the classic by Hartshorn and May or others have failed to find relationships between measures of religiosity and ethical behavior, non-delinquency, humanitarianism, and altruism. In contrast, several studies have found the religious less likely than the non-religious to violate certain moral standards, end quote. Footnote 105 cites the source. They believe that their distinction helps explain the contrast and suggest that, quote, this particular confusion and much of the confusion surrounding the relationship between religion and morality derive from failure to distinguish two different types of ethical standards, the ascetic and the social, end quote. Footnote 106 cites the source. Social standards are said to prohibit, quote, actions which in general are harmful to the social group, end quote, and they predict that such standards are, quote, shared by the religious and the non-religious alike as part of a general social ideology, end quote, footnote 107 cites the source. By contrast, they characterize ascetic standards as stemming, quote, primarily from an ascetic religious tradition, end quote, and suggest that while, quote, Violations of ascetic standards may be held spiritually harmful to the perpetrator. Such violations are usually not directly or obviously harmful to the social group, at least in moderation. End quote. Footnote 108, 108 cites the source. They offer specific examples of both kinds of standards, which they then use in their research. Examples of anti-ascetic actions include, quote, included gambling for money on sports events, gambling for money at cards, or dice, smoking, non-marital heavy petting, non-marital sexual intercourse, intentionally looking at pornographic pictures, and drinking alcohol alcoholic beverages except for religious purposes, end quote. While examples of antisocial actions included, quote, stealing towels, spoons, or other articles from hotels, motels, and restaurants, uh, striking another person in anger except in self-defense, lying to a teacher concerning the reason for missing class or failing to complete an assignment, theft from an individual, intentionally taking articles belonging to other individuals, cheating on examinations, 
and deliberately placing unjust blame on another person for something that was really one's own fault, end quote. Footnote 109 cites the source. Middleton and Putney think that in instances where researchers established no positive correlation between religion and moral behavior, social standards were the primary criteria used by the researchers. Whereas in cases where a positive correlation was support, supported, ascetic standards were involved. As they put it, quote, we hypothesize that differences in behavior between the religious and the non-religious are confined to specific areas and are a product of differences in standards rather than of differential, differential upholdings of standards. Uh, end quote. Footnote 110 cites the source. As it turns out, this is exactly what they find to be the case in their own study. They make several interesting discoveries, noting, for example, that the non-religious do not engage in violations of social standards any more than the religious do. In fact, they found that the non-religious violate them less often, although this finding was not statistically significant at the 0.05 uh, level. Moreover, they found that the religious are less likely to engage in viola violations of ascetic standards, but that they are also more likely to subscribe to them in the first place. Finally, they observed that the behavior of the non-religious matches their beliefs and standards just as much as the behavior of the religious matches theirs. That is, they are equally likely to live up to their own ethical standards, whatever those standards may be. Hence, the non-religious, quote, are less likely to re regard anti-ascetic actions as wrong, but when they do regard them as wrong, they are no more likely than believers to engage in them, end quote. Footnote 111 cites the source. As for upholding the social standards one believes in, they found that, quote, believers violate their social convictions more often than skeptics, end quote. Footnote 112 cites the source. It is also worth noting that, quote, despite specific differences, the same overall picture emerges regardless of the measure of religiosity utilized, end quote. Footnote 113 cites the source. Footnote 114. They employ three measures of religiosity. One, ideo ideological, believers versus atheist agnostics and deists. Two, ritualistic, attended church once every two weeks versus occasional or never. And three, intensity, agreement or disagreement with the statement, religion is one of the most important things in my life. And I cite the source. End of footnote 114. Supporting the case that Hauser and Singer make, as well as Mill's case, Middleton and Putney found that, quote, with regard to actions which, uh, which have an obvious harmful imp impact on society, there is little or no apparent difference between the religious and the irreligious in either in normative standards or behavior, end quote. And this leads them to conclude, quote, that the religious and the non-religious in our society share the same basic social values and are about equally likely to live up to them, end quote. Uh, footnote 115 cites the source. As I have indicated, some research actually indicates that religion is negatively correlated with moral behavior. In his interesting article, Cross-National Correlations of Quantifiable Social Health with Popular Religiosity and Secularism in the Prosperous Democracies, Gregory S. Paul examines the relationship between religiosity, secularism, and social welfare, and he sets out to provide a, quote, quantitative cross-national analysis, end quote, of their interaction, which he suggests, quote, is feasible because a large body of survey and census data on rates of religiosity, secularization, and social societal indicators has become available in the prosperous developed democracies, including the United States, end quote. Footnote 116 cites the source. Paul's work is concerned first and foremost with the thesis that religiosity is socially beneficial. Expanding on what this thesis entails, he writes, quote, in broad terms, the hypothesis that popular religiosity is socially beneficial holds that high rates of belief in a creator as well as worship, prayer, and other aspects of religious practice correlate with lowering rates of lethal violence, suicide, non-monogamous sexual activity, and abortion, as well as improved physical health." End quote. Footnote 117 cites the source. One important limitation regarding this kind of research, which he points out, 
is that religious belief and practice, quote, have been mostly extensively and reliably surveyed in the prosperous developed democracies, end quote. And, quote, similar data is often lacking for second and third world nations or is less reliable, end quote. Footnote 118 cites the source. Furthermore, I should note, as he does, that the data he works with is, quote, from the 1990s, most from the middle and latter half of the decade, or the early 2000s, end quote. And it chiefly looks at, quote, Bible literalism and frequency of prayer and service attendance, as well as absolute belief in a creator, in order to examine relig religiosity in terms of ardency, conservatism, and active activities, end quote. Footnote 119 cites the source. <clears throat> Interestingly, he prefaces his results by noting that the, quote, United States is the only prosperous first world nation to retain rates of religiosity otherwise limited, limited to the second and third worlds, end quote. Footnote 120 cites the source. This is especially worth noting after considering the results of Paul's analysis, since he finds that the U.S. is often unique among the first world nations in terms of moral characteristics. For instance, he discovers that, quote, the U.S. is the only prosperous democracy that retains high homicide rates, end quote. Footnote 121 cites the source. And that the United States experiences high rates of certain STDs. For example, it suffers, quote, uniquely high adolescent and adult syphilis infection rates, end quote. Footnote 122 cites the source. Also, he finds that, quote, early adolescent pregnancy and birth have dropped in the developed democracies. And I cite the source there. But rates are two to, do two to dozens of times higher in the U.S. where the decline has been more modest. Footnote, or end, uh, end of quote, footnote 123 cites the source. He finds results that are consistent with these global findings when he analyzes religiosity, secularity, and morality within the, within the borders of the United States, writing that, quote, there is evidence that within the U U.S., strong disparities in religious belief versus acceptance of evolution are correlated with similar similarly varying rates of societal dysfunction. The strongly theistic anti-evolution South and Midwest having markedly worse homicide, mortality, STD, youth pregnancy, marital and related problems than the, than the Northeast where societal conditions, secularization, and acceptance of evolution approach European norms. And I quote the source there, end of quote, footnote 124 cites the quote, or us. Uh, Yes, that's the source. More generally, Paul found that, quote, lifespan ten, lifespans tend to decrease as rates of religiosity rise, end quote. Footnote 125 cites the source. And he also notes that, quote, increasing adolescent abortion rates show positive correlation with increasing belief in worship of a creator and negative correlation with increasing non-theism and acceptance of evolution. Again, rates are uniquely high in the U.S., End quote. Which leads him to conclude that, quote, claims that secular cultures aggravate abortion rates, John Paul II, are therefore contradicted by the quantitative data, end quote. Footnote 126 cites the source. In sum, quote, higher rates of belief in and worship of a creator correlate with higher rates of homicide, juvenile and early adult mortality, STD, STD infection rates, teen pregnancy, and abortion in the prosperous democracies, end quote. Footnote 127 cites the source. Given the high degree of religiosity in the U.S., quote, if the data showed that the U.S. enjoyed higher rates of societal health than the more secular pro-evolution democracies, then the opinion that the popular belief in a creator is strongly beneficial to national cultures would, would be supported. End quote. Footnote 128 cites the source. However, as I have indicated, Paul's findings fail to show this, and he notes that, to the contrary, quote, the most theistic, prosperous democracy, the U.S., is exceptional. The United States is almost always the most dysfunctional of the developed democ democracies, sometimes spectacularly so and almost always scores poorly, end quote. Footnote 129 cites the source. What's more, quote, the populations of secular democracies are clearly able to govern themselves and maintain societal cohesion, end quote, and thus, quote, 
the widely widely held fear that a godless citizenry must experience societal disaster is therefore refuted. End quote. Footnote 130, 130 cites the source. Paul's findings are clear, clearly consistent with what Mills says. I do not mean to suggest that all the empirical research fails to support the thesis that religion elicits moral benefits. This is by no means the case. Indeed, some research indicates that the religious are more likely to subscribe to moral standards and beliefs. Consider a study conducted by Mark Ter Vort, Albert Feeling, and John Peters, Peters, which suggests that the non-religious embrace more of a, quote, self-interest morality and are less inclined to view, for example, honesty as a duty. Footnote 131 cites the source. Similarly, in a recent article published in Evolution and Human Behavior, Quentin D. Atkinson and Pierrick Borat discussed the results of their analysis of cross-cultural survey data from 87 countries, where, among other things, they find that both, one, belief in God, and two, belief in hell and heaven and hell, are positively correlated to belief in the unjustifiability of a host of moral transgressions, including cheating on taxes, adultery, speeding, and buying stolen goods. Footnote 132 cites the source. One limitation with respect to these two studies is that they only pertain to moral beliefs and not to moral action. It is one thing to say and believe that telling the truth is a moral duty. It is quite another to actually tell the truth. However, some research has found that as religiosity increases, moral behavior does, in fact, decrease. Sorry. However, let me start over. However, some researchers have found that as re religiosity increases, moral behavior does, in fact, increase. Take, for example, an experiment conducted by James M. Bloodgood, William H. Turnley, and Peter Mudrack, in which they presented subjects with an opportunity to increase their chances of winning money by untruthfully representing or re reporting their success on a word search task. The more word subjects reported finding, the greater their prospects for financial gain. What they found was that higher religiosity, which they measured by, by participation in religious activities, was a predictor of more honest reporting of the number of words found while performing the task. Footnote 133 cites the source. Likewise, Kent R. Curley, Todd L. Matthews, and Tro Troy C. Blanchard did an analysis of survey data collected from inmates at the Mississippi State Penitentiary in Parchman, Mississippi, which is one of the largest prisons in the United States, and discovered that inmates who claimed to be religious were less likely to argue with other inmates and less likely to fight with other inmates. Footnote 134 cites the source. Only 53.1% of prisoners who believed in a higher power reported arguing once or more per month, compared with 73.9% of prisoners who did not. 18.5% of prisoners who believed in a higher power reported fighting once per month, as opposed to 26.5% of those who did not. 130, footnote 135 cites the source. The findings in these last two studies suggest that religious belief makes a positive difference with regard to moral behavior, not just with regard to moral beliefs and standards. Therefore, these findings conflict with the research I referenced earlier, for example, Middleton's and Putney's. And as I've said before, an examination of empirical research renders the true nature of, a, of the relationship between religion and morality anything but clear. In this section, I've tried to do two things. One, point out that since Mill's own time, we've had the opportunity to empirically test the thesis that re religion is morally advantageous, and two, show that research has thus far failed to substantiate this thesis, as indicated by the ample studies that call into question the positive influence of religion on morality. For every study I've come across that suggests a positive influence, like those just mentioned, there's at least one that suggests a neutral or negative influence, like those mentioned earlier. So again, that was section D of part two of chapter one from uh, again, Chapter 1, John Stuart Mill, Utility of Religion, from the Utility of Religion, Mill, Nietzsche, and James.